All right, guys, what's going on? It's Rick at Tobacco Grow coming to you with Cole. Today, we've got a really special uh, uh, addition to our show. We have got the lovely Michelle Stewart from CLE hey. Cigars and hey, the hey, lovely Christian <laughs> Iroa. Christian Iroa is a man enough. himself is with us today. Christian, how you doing? I'm doing well, man. I can't say I'm actually, uh, I'm, I can't say I'm tired of doing much, much of anything, but I'm here. <laughs> hanging out with everybody else is doing i Absolutely, love the background man. <laughs> yeah man there's a lot of ogres behind you a couple of them man there are more here in the picture than we have in the warehouse i can tell you that <laughs> <laughs> what are we what are we smoking today michelle i see you've got something lit up what do you got going oh the aroa 20th colorado man oh Oh, great smoke. Nice. It's like my, that's it's my favorite. Great, it's like your first time, your first smoke of the day, man. It's a great smoke. I know. I know. What are you guys I, smoking? I got the, uh, the CLE Connecticut in the, the little 40 by four side, the little guy right here. The good little size, man. It, it, it's, my wife's perfect. Size. it's perfect for this interview, right? We've yep. got, I mean, it's, it's a perfect cigar for it. So. Absolutely. What about you, Cole? You're Dude, in I'm indoors. I have a whole moving project in my back in, in my uh, in my neighborhood. So I, me being outside would sound like I was in like a dump truck facility. <laughs> so I got like nothing going on. I got guys oh, picking stuff that. out of people's yards, dude. It's just like it's it's great. Now that you so show I'm that on the indoor one for the for the floor. Now that you show that forty by four, you know, back in Camacho we had the thirty two by five and a half, which was a real popular size here in Miami, and then we had I think the Bonitas. I forget what size they were and. But the 40 by 4 in this new company, we did it because we're trying to enter the Spanish market. And the problem with Spain is that they're extremely price sensitive. Because imagine, retailers work on a 7% fixed margin, no matter what the brand. You yeah. can't give away lighters. You can't give anything away, right? So for us to compete, we have to be a nickel below the Cuban cigars. It's just the way it is over there. So, you know, we, we came out with a cigar. I think it was supposed to be at 395 it was supposed to be the entry level for us to be able to get to the Spanish market. And uh, it worked. But, you know, my wife, when I was working on she goes, oh, I really love these. And she likes it in the Euro first 20 because we have them in those sizes too. So she fell in love. That's what she smokes now, that 40 by 4 size. And I actually like that size a lot too. It's a great 25, 30-minute cigar, man. It makes it, well, makes it work. The European market really traditionally doesn't like big, large ring gauges. They like a smaller, you know, it's shorter smoke. You know, that used to be true. And the big changer has been social media because the european market used to be that for example somebody somebody your age will walk into a store and you'll be poorly seen by the older guys that are hanging in the store so you just didn't feel welcome right, right. so if you're not feeling welcome you can't walk in the store you can't really learn about many cigars and the options were mostly just cuban brands so with social media eventually younger smokers 25 to 35 really began to explore and experiment with new cigars that they would see posted and they started demanding it so now i got to the point where in a lot of european countries where we used to be maybe we mean caribbean cigars in general we used to be five ten percent of the market we're now 45 even 50 percent of the market we've taken that much market share from the cubans wow. you, know, you got a lot a lot more variety something new plus the the, the most the uh, the most compelling thing is that my father smokes Cuban cigars is the mentality, right? You know, I don't want to smoke what old people smoke. I want to smoke what the young people are smoking. By young, I mean 25 to 35. Right. You know, well, you guys else are, it? What's, speaking of sizes, I mean, you guys are kind of the king of having an enormous amount of portfolio for different sizes. I mean, were you guys one of the first ones that came out with the, the 70 by 7s and, and whatnot? Well... No, no, we were not the first. The first was, um, I mean, we can go back. And you remember Puro Cinders had that Indian Chief. That was a 10 by yep. 66, I think. Or in, uh, but, you know, in, in recent history, I think JFR had a 7 by 7. And I remember when, because I was out of it for about a year, when I was serving out my non-compete, I really had visited no customers. I really respected it, right? Plus, I, I was busy losing money in a seaplane business I got myself into. <laughs> All I needed was a little uh, Asian guy saying the plane coming, serving that, that island in Bimini. So, a, uh, you know, we had the um, – so when I'm at the factory – and it, it, it all happened by accident, which is what I enjoy most about the story. And I was working on these blends in Honduras, and it took me, I don't know, four or five months to work on the CLE blends. And we finished early, 
on a Friday, I said, hey, let's go to Nicaragua. I know this one factory. They're not too busy. They just lost a huge customer. Let's go visit them, see what's going on. Bro, the asylum blend, we were going to do one cigar. We ended up with three cigars at that factory. And it took us, it couldn't have taken us more than an hour and a half or two hours for all these blends to be decided. And then I was on the phone with Tom. That's when we actually talked on the phone because that's when uh, I calling started happening. I met whatever. So it was pretty exciting. It was a free call. Oh, it's even better. As I remember paying five bucks a minute for those stupid calls before. So Tom says, man, you know, we should do a 70 by 7. I see that they're always empty. And I, I really thought that was a really, really dumb idea. So I told Tom, yeah, the bet because we do this all the time. Said, all right, listen, I'm gonna make fi- uh, five thousand of them, and you're gonna eat them, and because uh, I know they're not gonna sell, bro. They came out, and the thing that really helped that brand was again was social media, man. Because yeah, I think when somebody posted a, a picture with a cigar, they wanted to be outrageous. And all of a sudden, they start smoking the cigar. They actually realized and back then the cigars came out at seven dollars, to seventy by seven. And a guy's, a guy's thinking, man, you know, for, for seven bucks, I got three hours. It's not a bad gig, man. So they, they actually enjoyed that cigar. And it, stuck. and it wasn't until my competitors came out and started copying that cigar. Especially when, when the payback came out. That was the happiest day of my life. And I remember Tom was very upset. He felt betrayed by his buddy. I said, Tom, he just did you the best favor ever, man. Just read the 22 Immutable Laws of Brand. And the copycat brand always makes the original brand the superstar. And that's the best thing that could happen to us, man. It, it was, it really was a, a, a great time for us. And we launched it because well, coming back in, people were expecting me to make the same cigars as Camacho, which I didn't want to do. I wanted to challenge myself. But we also needed, I, I needed, I knew that we needed to stand out somehow. And the 70 by 7 was really that, that one uh, interesting thing that we did. And it was all thanks to an argument with Tom Lazuka. It was his idea. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, I remember that. I remember that uh, that release of the big payback or whatever. I remember when that was that pitched too. and everything like that. And and we didn't take it in. Um, we we just, I don't know. It just didn't. It didn't sit right with us. So we didn't even bring it in at all. So. <laughs> well, thank you. Yeah, we got you, Christian. But I, but I'm glad thank that you. it did something good for you. You know. Oh my God, it was incredible, man. That's awesome. Well, Chris, yeah, I want to ask you. Now, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. I want to ask you too. I know with a lot of stuff kind of going on right now with like uh, coronavirus and everything else, I wanted to bring this up because I, I don't think a lot of people know um, about the best practices that you have for the, your relationship with Bayer. Like when we went to the fields and stepping in and, you know, all the hygienic things that you do for the industry. Uh, can you touch on that a little bit? Of kind of what yeah, man. You know, what? and it's funny about. how things happen, right? So I, I always grew up very competitive, especially because my brother Justo. You know, my, my brother, who's so just so everybody knows, he used to kick my ass all the time. So I had to compete with a guy, you know, you know he used to, always used to pick. He's six years older than I am. So, you know, he played football. I had to play football. He wrestled. I had to wrestle. So it just made me very competitive. So I remember one time Lou Rothman, who used to own JR Cigars, this is back in the probably in the 80, early 90s, probably 91, 92. He visits our factory and then tells South Fontana, the late South Fontana, says, hey, you know, we went to the, you know, that factory in Honduras. That's one of the dirtiest places I've ever seen. And, you know, so I started working with the old man in 95, and I always had this whole thing about germs my whole life. Sure. And then I go visit the Estelo Padron factory, which is Villazon. They used to make Hoyo Monterey punch, yeah. General Cigar Bottom. Estelo Padron, one of my mentors, and my, to me, him and Rolando Reyes, the best manufacturers in the history of cigars, period. That's it. So I go visit Estelo, and his operation is so clean. Man, the whole trip, in the most complimentary way possible, I was pissed off. Really pissed off. I said, you know what? That old guy can't have a cleaner factory. And that, that's when we started yeah. the whole clean, uh, cleanliness process. I remember before, the rollers used to be able to smoke cigarettes at the factory, right? So you would have every table, every cigar roller table, if you can imagine, like the front yeah. edge, they would put the cigarettes. So the ashes would fall in, like, in the blends and everything. Of, well, the the guys <laughs> bring ashtrays, and the guys wouldn't bring ashtrays. I said, okay, fine. You know what? That's it. From now, no one can smoke cigarettes in the factory. Then they started bringing candy. Then oh, you no. see candy wrappers over the floor. I go, okay, fine. No one can bring candy. And then we have this one fruit in Honduras that comes out one time a year. It's called ciruela. I, I, I have no idea what the name is in English. Where it's pretty much <laughs> the, 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 they, they suck out the outside, and, and then the shell is like, that big, whatever's left. It looks sure. like a like a like a peanut, right? Whatever is left. Yeah. And they would throw it all over the place. I said, all right, fine. Listen, no more eating, no more smoking, nothing in the factory. <laughs> and then we started hiring. They used to get on Luis, the factory, he's still our factory manager now. 
I said, dude, I want two or three people cleaning. And then the same thing started happening because, they, you know, when you have comp comp compulsive uh, problems, you know, you just can't stop. And then the farms turned out to be the same thing. Sure. Bayer at that time was making – and this, this goes back to 95, 96, 97. So it takes a few years to create the culture. Sure. Bayer is making a strong move for us tobacco growers and Bayer Crop Science, their side. And they, they noticed what we were doing. Said, look, you know, we got this program. You guys want to participate. So it took us probably another nine years for us to qualify. And they certified us in 2009, I believe. Sure. We finally got, and, and it was zero damage to the environment and better, a, better growing practices and then better manufacturing practices. But they, they, they couldn't certify the, farm, uh, the factory because, sure. you know, they're a human health company, right? So right. Yeah, it's not. It wasn't going to look very good if, 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 uh, if they went ahead and they endorsed the cigar company. But right. with these measures, we have this misting system that people have to walk through. You have to step on this one sponge that has this, this antibacterial product. Even your truck also, when, when you walk in, drive into the farm, you, know, you have to spray your tires. We have our own doctor, our own nurse in both places. We've never had an outbreak of any kind, not even flu, nothing, nothing like that ever. Well, I mean, since I've been there, I mean, I say yeah. for 20, some 23, 24 years. And uh, now when the coronavirus started, you know, we had the missing system and people have to wash their hands every so often. And of course, listen, sometimes we get some people that, that won't do it. And, and just like you can't tell me every restaurant worker in the world washes right. their hands all the time. But it's part of retraining. So we, we've been retraining and they allowed us to reopen a, the, the tobacco processing fermentation. And we're now talking to them about allowing us to reopen the factory at a very limited, limited scale now. Sure. Probably half the, we're not that big now anyway. It'll be half the personnel and make sure that the packing works. So it's a slow process. You know, we're still extremely concerned. Health is first. You know, these people in Honduras really are, don't have the benefits that we have in the U.S. And the, the education, the benefits, the medicine. So we've been very fortunate that in El Paraíso, which is our, our department, it's like the state, we had zero cases so far. We're very, very fortunate with that. The, the government was able to lock people in their homes, which is, I mean, it can't last very long because people, you know, you're starting to get riots now in the capital. Right. Well, you, so you we're brought, fortunate now, but the measures worked. They helped us. You brought me to kind of my next question. I remember because Cole and I have been down to, to see the factory we, right. in Honduras. We've been there. Um, we've seen the tobacco fields, and, and three of the things that I took away for it was, you know, first of all, wow, this whole bear thing was incredible. I'd never seen anything like it. You know, yeah. everything was immaculately organized and clean, right? And the second thing that I brought away from it was that, and maybe most people don't know this, you did everything there. You had your, your, your boxes were being made there, you know, and, and obviously in a separate area. But um, I thought that was incredible that everybody is, you know, this community is putting all of this together. And most people don't, they think, oh, it's some company in China making this, et cetera. And it's not, it, you're doing it, you know? Yeah, no, you know, I, I fought that temptation with China. I mean, we've made lighters there before, we made cutters in cases. Uh, I've always fought it because there, there's so many people in Honduras that need work. Right. Why make it someplace else? Even with the boxes, I know some companies now in Honduras, we got one company just fired almost the entire box pack because they're bringing the stuff in from China. Wow. And, you know, look at man. We are in a very, what's, what's, what's the word I'm looking for? We're a very fortunate position that we can get, have the pleasure of helping other people. Because, you know, whatever you do in our lives can't just be about money all the time. Right. At some point, you got to be able to give back to somebody and help people out. And I like the fact that we're able to employ so many people. Obviously, look at man, you know, we're a company, right? We got to make a profit and we are going to seek out efficiencies in a lot of places, but we'll try to make as much possible. We tried to do uh, engineer Carlos Cruz. I mean, the, the poor kid has fantastic time, right? He started two weeks ago. Now he's on vacation for like a month. <laughs> he's vacation. Awesome. Kind of like Michelle's job. So, Very much. That's, that's, he, he's so anyway, so. <laughs> but we're actually trying to see if we can get the factory efficient up. We're changing some of the woods that we're using. We're trying to see if we can increase the efficiency and actually start making humaners ourselves in Honduras too. And the more I can, I will remove and stop using products out of China, especially with what's happened now, man. This is it's sure. really bothering me at all. That's a whole different conversation. And that that one we have a whole bit. We don't have that type of Zoom time. <laughs> That's right. I heard you guys are on a budget. 
Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. We're just doing the free one. I'm not. I'm not paying the fifteen dollars a month. What do you mean? Hold on. You mean the the SBA uh, relief yeah. they gave you for the fifteen bucks? No, not yet. Nothing yet. No, I'm still waiting on my check. So. <laughs> That'll come in December. That's our Christmas present to ourselves. Thirty bucks. Me and right. we're fifteen apiece. Nice. Clergy, <laughs> baby. Clergy. <laughs> Well, you mentioned, you know, I, and I want to, I want to call you guys out on something, man. It's really great, you guys, and all the other stores that have remained open, man. It really is huge because I think that we, in, in what we do, I think we actually, we're not an essential service, obviously, sure. but we do become part of somebody's day, and the fact that you can provide that sense of normalcy to a customer or two or twenty a week or fifty, I don't know. It, it really is a great thing, and I really admire that, man. And uh, and it's it's really a horrible situation. I've been calling. I call about maybe twenty or thirty customers a day and see how they're doing, and really have a lot of admiration toward them and the staff that go into work, because the staff could very well just stay home too and, and not go. And same thing with our company as well. Right. We have we have a great crew of guys who walk in. And Michelle was nice enough to give them pizza, which Michelle was actually just talking to guys who want pizza. I thought I was gonna be late for the call, but I made it on time. I was talking to guys on Pizza Hunter Honduras. I'm going to try to see if I can do a Friday thing yeah. in uh, Lee and feed the workers from our factories. Just the logistics are – logistics are going to be tough. we got to figure it out. That's awesome. I, I appreciate you saying that, too, because, yeah. you know, we found that the cigar shop is not even a retail environment. It's its, its own community. And, yes. mm -hmm. you know, there, there's some customers that we have that are there literally every single day. And they really may not have much to go back home to at this point. And, you know, I mean, we've, we've actually had customers mm -hmm. that have driven to the store just to have a cigar in their car in the park, um, and just relax in their car. They'll have a cigar and everything. And, you know, and I mean, it's, it's really touching to see. And, and you yeah. just have to realize you're right. We're not an essential business, but I think what we do as far as developing a community and the camaraderie we have is really needed at a time like this. A hundred percent, man. Yeah, and we had to get creative. I mean, we did curbside to go for about a little over a week and a half. And then, uh, you know, now we're in almost the full two weeks in the quarantine. But it was really successful. It was surprising. We had a lot of guys actually plow through a lot of the Aroa stuff. So, Michelle, I have like nothing <laughs> left. <laughs> I like to hear that. One box of Hamish, we, we killed through it. I had a customer took the three boxes off the shell and the one in upstock because he was fearful that we would get anything in. Yeah. So, yeah, we're doing great customers. Yeah. Because I know this need exists. We're opening up. Uh, this week we'll do Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Next week we'll probably work Tuesday and Thursday to ship stuff out to a few customers. I know that, uh, which you can bust Mike Denny on this, Michelle. Uh, <laughs> they, they took alcohol out of the uh, central list here in Florida. So ABC will be shut down this month. Uh, it, yeah, listen, man, we can joke about it. It's an internal thing because we got this whole competition between Michelle and Mike. But, <laughs> a, a, um, but it's still unfortunate. Yes. Yeah, I mean, but you know, we're 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 trying to keep cigar stores supplied. See, the real pro you know, I talked to our, our, our guys the other day. If you guys think these two weeks or four weeks or five weeks are gonna be tough, you really you really have to wait and see the rebuilding process afterward. Because this just started in our countries two weeks ago. So that means that our factories could very well be at a very slow and low output for the next two, three, four months. We don't know how long it's going to take down there. So, uh, you know, the fact that let's, let's assume for a second that, okay, April 30th, that's it. May 1st, everybody get back to work. It doesn't mean that we're going to have cigars coming in. It doesn't mean that, that our countries are going to be able to pick up the pace at the same, at the same speed. So our schedule is going to run differently over there. You know, Christian, I wanted to bring up something I thought was really important. And I, I specifically want to speak with you because you have been a, a Everybody I can think of in the in the industry right now, uh, you and Rocky Patel probably are the two most uh, uh, outspoken and most uh, have most effort. It seems like into dealing with the FDA right now and and the regulations that are that are coming with cigars. And you know, first of all, thank you for being a part of that, for being at the tip of the spear for that because I know there are a lot of people that aren't stepping up and that aren't doing things and there's companies that really aren't doing as much as they probably could like what I've seen from you and what I've seen from Rocky. Could you talk to the people a little bit about what some of the FDA, what it means to the consumer? You know, we know it's, it's disastrous for, for the industry. A little bit about the consumer. Well, you know, actually it's, it's a lot easier to talk about it now. If you see 
you know, when we see these these briefings, right, uh, Fauci and Trump, that they, they were able to eliminate a lot of these barriers at FDA, we listen, we, we, we're, not, we're not a comparison. I'm just talking about the process itself, of course. Sure. You know, for, for, I don't know, pick any drug, whatever. This malaria drug. If the malaria drug were coming out today on a regular environment without the whole corona thing, it would take them almost two years or three years to get out. And, I mean, just think about the amount of money involved. Just the lawyers alone are seven fifty to a thousand dollars an hour, yeah. right? And you got to do these reports. So they're making us do. Originally, they wanted us to do these similar processes. So if I wanted to come out with a new size, I don't know, call it a 50, 50 by seven and a half, right? A new size that that didn't exist before. Whatever, just come out with any size. Mm -hmm. It would take me almost twenty nine thousand dollars in three or four years to really develop that product. And we all very well know in a cigar business. Some brands take from day one. Some brands just don't take, period. Right. Customer, and, and, and it's, it's amazing how it happens in our business that if a brand picks up in, in, in your area, it picks up, in, it picks up everywhere just, just like that. Either, either people like it. So imagine spending 30000 bucks in two years. You come up with a size, and the size just doesn't work. You're like, oh, damn, what do I do now? You got to start the process all over again. So right. we, we have been very fortunate and – you know, and, and Rock, I do have to give my hands up to Rocky and everybody. You know, the, the, the CRA, the CAA, the, the IPCPR, or PCA now, they've been out there and we have gotten, the word's not favorable, but we got very, a, a sort of warm and fuzzies from legislators because they know the data already points them to the fact that cigars are not their problem. You know, youth don't smoke cigars, there's no increased mortality rate because of the smoking habits. They know all these, so, but, you know, they still don't want to take us out of the, uh, we're still under the umbrella, but they're really not crushing us. I mean, they came out and said, you know, we'll be the last priority in enforcement. Okay, we're the last priority, but what does that mean? Right. It's still illegal. I mean, you're still going to make us go through all these hoops. So we had this one restriction on May 12th, which is probably going to get kicked another four months or five months now. But we're also trying to – for substantial equivalence. That means that I have to be able to prove to you that my cigar is just like anybody else's cigar that was out there before. You know, pick whatever. Romeo Juliet, a 50 by 5. Yeah. That was around in 2007. You know, I'll be able to. I have to be able to prove that my 50 by five is the same as that one, which is. I mean, you would think it's easy to prove. Look, just take it apart, wrap yeah. a binder, fill it, right? But you know, when you get lawyers involved and and pencil neck scientists involved, it's it's a whole different thing. So it's a process, man. But we're out there fighting it because it means something to us, and there's so many people that depend on us. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I want to ask you too, because I know I've, I've always wondered as far as you went back to like uh, sizes of certain cigars, the 11, t talk to me a little bit about the, the significance of the 11 and 18 size that you have, the kind of that small <laughs> figure out. Yeah, it's yeah listen, cool when, when one, I, it's I've always cool. thought the prettiest thing I've ever seen was years ago when I first went to Germany, I saw a box of oil in Monterey. I think it was Epicure number two. Yep. And the box was sitting there. The cigars had no bands on it. I said, man, isn't that arrogant? I loved it, right? I love the arrogance of it. So I came out with a diploma back then, and the diploma had no band. Uh -huh. And that was the one in that pyramid box. I said, you know, let me make the box so hard to open that people remember. Right. And I had this kid working with us, Salim Hanono. He's with Ernesto Carrillo now. And Salim's like, you know, Salim's always that guy that's looking for, not that he's a schemer, but, you know, he, he, he's very uh, cynical, right? So he's like, oh, hold on, man. Christian, I can just put in any any other 50 by 5 in there and say it's the diploma. I said, all right. So when we're having the conversation, I have this this marker in my hand, and I'm rolling the, the marker on the – you know, I'm, I'm playing with a marker on the table. And I go, oh, shit, let me make it this shape. And the shape was what the 1118 shape is now, which is like a 52 by 54 by 50 by 6. And I give it to my factory guy. I said, dude, make me this cigar. So we had we had that cigar made. And 1118 is my mother's birthday, November 18th, because she always wanted a cigar named after her. Sure. That cigar made, became really, really popular. Then like a year and a half later, I came out with a 705 after my birthday. I remember and, that. That, one, that one never sold. That <laughs> 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 was a genius idea at the time, but it never worked. <laughs> I got to tell you real quick. the 4th of July, man. I got to tell yeah. you real quick about the, uh, you, you mentioned the old Camacho diploma in the little pyramid, right? So back, yeah. it goes back to, I started getting into cigars back in probably the late 90s. And I remember going yeah, to the shop, funny. okay? Yeah, I think I've told Cole this story. I remember going into my shop. Yeah. Time, and usually, typically, I was smoking, you know, 
Hoya de Monterey, Epicures, you know, Classic, et cetera. You know, that was the top of my brain. And I remember the guy said, hey, you got to check out this really cool box. And, and it's this new cigar. It's, it's, it's by this band, Camacho. Now, this didn't have a band on it, if I remember right, correct? There's no right. band on it? Yeah, okay. Yeah. And I remember him taking this box up and us both so which, where are you supposed to open this thing, right? We finally open it. We get this cigar. And I remember it was a big cigar compared to what I was used to smoking at the time. Right, right. So I remember cutting this thing up. I remember, I remember specifically, I was, I, was playing a, I was playing billiards. I was playing pool, right? I started smoking this cigar, okay? And I'm like, wow, this, is, this flavor is amazing. Oh, my gosh. And I'm getting into it. And I'm telling you about maybe I hit about the halfway point. And I, <laughs> green. I was green, right? I was like the color of the candela walker behind me. And I'm like, because I'm, I'm puffing this thing down. I'm just hammering this thing, right? It's as green as the felt. I never had anything the table. in my life. And that was the day I got introduced to Christian cigars. That was the first time ever. Right there. Hey, Coca-Cola, man. Coca-Cola and sugar, man. It will fix it up real, <laughs> real nice. And you know, the, the genius behind it, accidental, because I, I really, I wasn't that smart then. I'm not that smart now, man. But, you know, that box, what made that box so smart was the fact that because the opening is so small, yeah. Air doesn't escape. You know, I was at a store, what, last year? So, dude, I swear to you, man, that cigar tasted just like it came out of the – because she had in the original box still. No That way. cigar had the exact same body as it when it left, just the way I remembered it. Wow. And um, I'm trying to get that done again this year. You know, we, we've done – I'm trying to get that kind of body again. The main difference is we've been aging our tobacco now four or five years for consistency. Sure. So, when I do the next batch, I don't know what I'm going to call it yet, a, a, um, I'm probably just going to age the tobacco two years, a year and a half or two years, so it'll have a lot of that body that it used to have. I have some tobacco coming in now, so hopefully I, I can have that tobacco out by next year and uh, on that cigar. So I'm really looking forward to trying to get it done again because I did enjoy it. You know, and for a while with this new company, I try to do more medium-body cigars. But, you know, the Tiger, you can't change your stripes, man. I, I like full-body cigars. I'm actually <laughs> smoking a dark now, which I like the body on it. Sure. And I think this other one's going to be stronger even. We've killed through that. That's a really good smoke. The dark. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Anything, uh, any types of teasers, Christian, you want to give us about maybe some, some projects that might be coming up here in the near future this year that we might be able to look forward to? Yeah. Listen, we have the Asylum 8 coming up, which we'll do one every year to collect. It's a collective type of cigar. And uh, I, have that, I had that blend pretty much finalized. I'm doing another one called the uh, CLE. I think we're going to call it the graduate because 2020 is my son Christian's graduation from, from high school, uh, which, uh, I mean, the kid got screwed over. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But, you know, it'll be called the graduate because of that. And uh, but that cigar should be out this year also. We don't have a launch date yet, obviously now. Everything's up in the air. But we do have the blends. I have the tobacco. I have everything all set. I just got to get it out there. Perfect. Well, listen, guys, I'm going to we're, we're almost out of time because I just got my notification that said, hey, you got to <laughs> yeah, we have nine minutes and 50 seconds left. <laughs> hey, do you remember the days when we used to go up, be able to go out to fancy restaurants and have oh. a premium account on Zoom? Hey, man. Those days are gone, baby. We're back to 1985. Go back. We're going to a steak joint. Yeah. 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 That's over, okay. man. <laughs> well, listen, we're going to run into Doc Brown in this time machine, man. We went back 30 years. <laughs> <laughs> I got the DeLorean in my garage, man. <laughs> well, listen, Don't worry. me back, man. I want to thank Michelle for, for joining us on this, uh, taking the time out. And, and I want to thank Christian, you know, for taking the time out. Um, this has been outstanding. I think it's great to get all this information. It's, it's just great to hear you tell stories, you know, about yeah. Yeah. You can all and learn. I and I appreciate being like your ninth call, man. <laughs> Look, man, it's a war you got to warm up before you get to the big show. We can't, we can't like, play around and go, oh, we'll just have Christian on the first one, and we'll just kind of wing it. Yeah, we, <laughs> we need to put some time in to make sure we had this thing figured out first, okay? No, I know, and actually, and, and I want to thank you guys for this idea. We, we tried out yesterday, so we'll, I think we'll probably get to do another one tomorrow, Michelle. We posted okay. on Instagram. We had a few people, and uh, it, I mean, it was like one big frat thing yesterday. So we're going to try to make sure uh, we make it a little more organized tomorrow. Oh, I know, and that's just, we're yeah. testing it out, and we're doing a lot of Tiger King backgrounds and and all kinds of stupid jokes. <laughs> don't ask Rick. About that. I don't even ask. I'm that, still obsessed with that show. No, That'll take a I half hour by itself. Episode, I'm hoping. I saw it already, man. Oh man, 
Rick Mike and the Tiger King tattoo, man. He's like way obsessed with that show. Even before we left the shop, I'm like, what is this? He's like, you haven't watched it? I'm going. Oh, dude, we should totally work down just a, a demonstration in front of Carol's place, man. <laughs> I hate that lady. You can't tell I'm, me. I'm on Team it. Joe, man. It sounds horrible, but I'm on Team Joe. I know. I am too. I am too. You know? <laughs> All right, buddy. Well, thank you again for joining. All right, good luck, guys. Take care, man. It. We'll see you guys later. Thanks, Michelle. Bye. <laughs>